I think I'm just going to read from the beginning of the book so it doesn't require much contextualization. It's a real pleasure to get to read with you guys and in this room. Um, my first public reading was in the Topeka Public Library. And this, so I feel like I've, I've really, I've, I've come a long way. Um, so I'll just read, read from the beginning of the book. The city had converted an elevated length of abandoned railway spur into an aerial greenway, and the agent and I were walking south along it in the unseasonable warmth after an outrageously expensive celebratory meal in Chelsea that included baby octopuses the chef had literally massaged to death. We had ingested the impossibly tender things entire, the first intact head I had ever consumed, let alone of an animal that decorates its lair, has been observed at complicated play. We walked south among the dimly gleaming disused rails and carefully placed stands of sumac and smoke bush until we reached that part of the high line where a cut has been made into the deck and wooden steps descend several layers below the structure. The lowest level is fitted with upright windows overlooking 10th Avenue to form a kind of amphitheater where you can sit and watch the traffic. We sat and watched the traffic, and I am kidding, and I am not kidding when I say that I intuited an alien intelligence, felt subject to a succession of images, sensations, memories, and affects that did not, properly speaking, belong to me. The ability to perceive polarized light, a conflation of taste and touch, as salt was rubbed into the suction cups, a terror localized in my extremities, bypassing the brain completely. I was saying these things out loud to the agent who was inhaling and exhaling smoke, and we were laughing. A few months before, the agent had emailed me that she believed I could get a strong six-figure advance based on a story of mine that had appeared in The New Yorker. All I had to do was promise to turn it into a novel. I managed to draft an earnest, if indefinite, proposal, and soon there was a competitive auction among the major New York houses, and we were eating cephalopods in what would become the opening scene. How exactly will you expand the story, she'd asked, far look in her eyes, because she was calculating tip. I'll project myself into several futures simultaneously, I should have said, a minor tremor in my hand. I'll work my way from irony to sincerity in the sinking city, a would-be Whitman of the vulnerable grid. A giant octopus was painted on the wall of the room where I'd been sent the previous September for evaluation. An octopus and starfish and various gill-bearing aquatic craniate animals, for this was the pediatric wing, and the sea scene was intended to calm and distract the children from needles or the small hammers testing reflex amplitude. I was there at the age of 33 because a doctor had discovered incidentally an entirely asymptomatic and potentially aneurysmal dilation of my aortic root that required close monitoring and probable surgical intervention, and the most common explanation of such a condition at such an age is Marfan, a genetic disorder of the connective tissue that typically produces the long-limbed and flexible. When I met with the cardiologist and he suggested the evaluation, I'd noted my excess proportion of body fat and conventional arm span and only slightly above average height, but he counter-noted my long, thin toes and mild double-jointedness and contended that I might well fall on the diagnostic spectrum. Most morphinoids are diagnosed in early childhood, thus the pediatric wing. If I had Marfan, the cardiologist had explained, the threshold of surgical intervention was lower, was basically nigh, because the likelihood of what they called dissection, a most often fatal tearing of the aorta, is higher among Marfanoids. If I did not have an underlying genetic condition, if my aorta was deemed idiopathic, I would still probably require eventual surgery, but with a more distant threshold and the possibility of much slower progression. In either case, I was now burdened with the awareness that there was a statistically significant chance the largest artery in my body would rupture at any moment, an event I visualized, however incorrectly, as a whipping hose spraying blood into my blood before collapse a far look comes into my eyes as though, etc. There I was at Mount Sinai Hospital underwater in a red plastic chair designed for a kindergartner, a chair that had the immediate effect of making me feel ungainly, gangly in my paper gown and thus confirming the disorder before the team of evaluators arrived. 
Alex, who would accompany me for what she called moral support, but was in fact practical support, as I had proved unable to leave a doctor's office with even the most basic recollection of whatever information had been imparted to me there, sat across from me in the lone adult chair, no doubt placed there for a parent, notebook open in her lap. I'd been told in advance that the evaluation would be conducted by a trio of doctors that would then consult and offer its opinion, which I thought of as a verdict, but there were two things about the doctors now entering with bright smiles that I was not prepared for. They were beautiful and they were younger than I. It was fortunate Alex was present because she would not have otherwise believed me, but the doctors, all of whom appeared to be originally from subcontinental Asia, were themselves ideally proportioned in their white coats with flawlessly symmetrical high-boned faces that, no doubt through some deft application of shadow and gloss, glowed with almost parodic health, even in hospital light, a dusky gold. I looked at Alex, who raised her eyebrows back at me. They asked me to stand and proceeded to calculate the length of my arms and the curvature of my chest and spine and the arch of my feet to perform so many measurements according to a nosological program mysterious to me that I felt as if my limbs had multiplied. That they were younger than I constituted an unfortunate milestone beyond which medical science could no longer stand in benevolent paternal relation to my body, because such doctors would now see in my pathologized corpus their own future decline and not their past immaturity. And yet in this room outfitted for children, I was simultaneously infantilized by three improbably attractive women in their mid to late twenties, while from the more than literal distance of her chair Alex looked on symp sympathetically. It can taste what it touches, but has poor proprioception, the brain unable to determine the position of its body in the current, particularly my arms, and the privileging of flexibility over proprioceptive inputs means it lacks stereognosis, the capacity to form a mental image of the overall shape of what I touch. It can detect local texture variations, but cannot integrate that information into a larger picture, cannot read the realistic fiction the world appears to be. What I mean is that my parts were coming to possess a terrible neurological autonomy, not only spatial but temporal, my future collapsing in upon me as each contraction expanded, however infinitesimally, the overly flexible tubing of my heart. Including myself, I was older and younger than everyone in the room. Her support was moral and practical, but also self-interested in that Alex had recently proposed impregnating herself with my sperm, not she was at immediate pains to make clear in copula, but rather through intrauterine insemination because, as she put it, fucking you would be bizarre. The subject was broached at the Metropolitan Museum, which we often visited weekday afternoon since Alex was unemployed and I a writer. We had met each other in my freshman and her senior year of college in a dull class about great novels and felt an instant and mutual sympathy, but had not become best friends until we found ourselves almost neighbors in Brooklyn when I moved there a few years after graduation and we began our walks. Walks through Prospect Park as light died in the Lindens, walks from our neighborhood of Borham Hill to Sunset Park where we would watch the soft wing kites at magic hour, nocturnal walks along the promenade with the looming intensities of Manhattan glittering across dark water. Six years of these walks on a warming planet, although walking wasn't all we did, had rendered Alex's presence inseparable from my sense of moving through the city so that I intuited her beside me when she wasn't. When I crossed a bridge in silence, I often felt it was silence shared between us, even if she was visiting her parents upstate or spending time with a boyfriend whom I could be counted on to hate. Maybe she broached the subject at the museum and not over coffee or the like because in the galleries as on our walks our gazes were parallel, directed in front of us at canvas and not at each other, a condition of our most intimate exchanges. We would work out our views as we co-constructed the literal view before us. We did not avoid each other's eyes, and I admired the overcast sky quality of hers, dark epithelium and clear stroma, but we tended to fall quiet when they met, which meant we'd eat a lunch in silence or idle talk only for me to learn on the subsequent walk home that her mother had been diagnosed in a late stage. 
You might have seen us walking on Atlantic, tears streaming down her face, my arms around her shoulders, but our gazes straight ahead. Or perhaps you've seen me during one of my own increasingly frequent lacrimal events, being comforted and kind while we moved across the Brooklyn Bridge, less a couple than conjoined. That day, we were standing before Jules Bastien Lepage's Joan of Arc. Alex looks a little like this version of her, and she said, apropos of nothing, I'm 36 and single. Thank God she had broken up with her latest, a divorced labor lawyer in his late 40s who had done some work for the health clinic she co-directed before it folded. After two glasses of wine, he invariably began regaling everyone within earshot with stories about his time undertaking suspiciously vague humanitarian labor in Guatemala. After three glasses of wine, the lawyer started in on his ex-wife's sexual repression and general frigidity. After four or five, he began to interweave these incommensurate discourses so that genocide and his feelings of sexual rejection achieved implied equivalence within his slurred speech. Whenever I was around, I made certain his glass was full. Not a day has gone by in the last six years when I haven't wanted a kid. I'm that cliche. I want my mom to meet my child. I have 75 weeks of unemployment benefits and insurance plus modest savings. And while I know that means I should be more afraid to reproduce than ever, what it actually makes me feel is that there will never be a good time, that I can't wait for professional and biological rhythms to coincide. We're best friends. You can't live without me. What if you donate the sperm? We could work out your level of involvement. I know it's crazy and I want you to say yes. Three translucent angels hover in the top left of the painting. They have just summoned Joan who has been working at a loom in her parents garden to rescue France. One angel holds her head in her hands. Joan appears to stagger toward the viewer reaching her left arm out maybe for support in the swoon of being called. Instead of grasping branches or leaves, her hand, which is carefully positioned on the sight line of one of the other angels, seems to dissolve. The museum placard says that Bastien Lepage was attacked for his failure to reconcile the ethereality of the angels with the realism of the future saint's body, but that failure is what makes it one of my favorite paintings. It's as if the tension between the metaphysical and physical worlds, between two orders of temporality, produces a glitch in the pictorial matrix. The background swallows her fingers. Standing there that afternoon with Alex, I was reminded of the photograph Marty carries in Back to the Future, crucial movie of my youth. As Marty's time traveling disrupts the prehistory of his family, he and his siblings begin to fade from the snapshot. Only here it's a presence, not an absence, that eats away at her hand. She's being pulled into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.